It is always a privilege. It was a privilege to, to share last week and uh, again this week to just continue the same theme of praise and worship. Um, and if you weren't here last week, I entitled my message Infinite and Intimate, which is the God we get to experience. He's both infinite far, far, far beyond us. But then at the same time, He is so, so close to us on a, on a, a microscopic or molecular level. Uh, he's closer than we can comprehend. Um, we've just sang a song about how it's His very breath in our lungs. Like His, uh, his presence permeates our lives as the children of God. There's so much to cover when we talk about worship and praise. There's just, uh, I mean, we could talk about this for, for years and years. Um, so in trying to unpack this uh, huge topic, we've been looking at three questions. And the first question we covered last week was, what does it mean to worship and praise something or someone? And the second question was, why do we worship and praise God? I'll go through a quick summary of those two questions because that's what we covered last week. And why do we choose to focus our worship and praise on God? I mean, there's so many things that we could worship and praise. Why, why God? So a quick recap of last Sunday. What does it mean to worship and praise something? All of us worship and praise all the time. It's just part of our human nature. It's what we do. If it's not God, it's something else. It's the weather. It's the countryside. It's the value of the rand, whatever it is, we are praising something, our sports team. It's not a question of if, but what we give our praise and our worship to. The world rings with praise. You don't have to look very far to find people praising something or someone. Um, my, my daughters enjoy uh, Shawn Mendes, and there was a concert that they were watching on Netflix, and it's a stadium in Toronto packed with worshippers. Of Sean Mendes. I mean, <laughs> as he comes out on stage, like, oh, God, my life's dreams are fulfilled. Um, these people worshiping this Canadian dude. So it's not a question of if, but what. Then the object of our worship and our praise will be the thing that we then give our lives to serve. When um, God spoke to Moses in, when he gave him the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he speaks about how um, you must worship your God and serve Him only. And that worship and service go together. So the thing that you worship will be the thing that you give your life to serve. Then why do we worship and praise God? Was the second question we looked at last week. Well, simply because the desire and the ability to praise and worship comes from Him in the first place. And unless our worship and praise is directed in His direction, we are going to be restless. Uh, we looked at that quote from Augustine of Hippo. You might know him as St. Augustine, where he said, This desire comes from you, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Only when we worship and praise God will the deepest longings of our hearts be fulfilled. Then we also looked at how God doesn't need our praise and worship. It doesn't make Him more God. It doesn't make Him feel better about Himself. <laughs> It doesn't make Him more complete as God. It's for our sake. It's not for His sake. The whole universe is already praising Him, whether we say anything. God does not need our praise, but it's for our benefit, our, for our eternal good. Paul speaks in Romans 12, verse 1, where he says, It's your fitting, your logical, your intelligent response, worship and praise to God. And the last thing we looked at last week is that God wants what He always has wanted, and that is worshipers, the hearts of people. He's after our hearts. So now, how do we do this? So, I've got three stops along our journey today um, to answer the question of how. But I must be very clear that this is not prescriptive. It's more a description of what we see in Scripture, how people have praised and worshipped God. But please don't leave here thinking, okay, well, if I've got to do it this way, and I have to do it this way, and I've got to... Uh, behave in a certain way in order for it to be worship that's in line with Scripture. Hopefully, after today, you will see that there are a vast number of things that you could do in praise and worship of God. I'm going to start with um, a, psalm, uh, a verse from Psalm 19, and it goes like this. 
The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. It's already happening. And uh, there's a, a, a guy, astrophysicist, who also happens to be a musician. And what he's currently doing, he has a, a project called System Sounds, and he's, he's developed another one where he's turning the night sky into musical compositions based on the brightness of the stars, their proximity, and planets, how close they are to each other as they orbit whatever star they are um, orbiting. And he's turned it into music. Now, these things are happening in space already. We just, they're at frequencies that we can't perceive, and he's turning them into a language that we can understand. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's the sound that's already in space. Heaven declares the glory of God. The skies proclaim as wonders. It carries on and says, day after day, night after night, they're pouring out speech. Their voice goes out into all the world. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 19. But now, it's not enough for us to sit back and say, go for it, space. Go for it, universe. You've got way more praise to offer God than I have. Because this psalmist ends the psalm by saying the following. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's against the backdrop of the praise of all creation that we bring the words of our mouth, the movements of our body, the meditations of our hearts before God. It's acceptable and it's pleasing to Him. Even though He's getting it already, day and night, it's for our good that we join the song. So how do we do this? So there are three stops along the journey today. The first one, answering the question of how. We're going to look at the full body experience of worship and praise. It's not just with your left hand. It is an entire body experience. We're going to look at that. Then we're going to look at the second thing, is what it means to worship and praise God in spirit and in truth. There's a passage in John 4 where Jesus says, the worshipers that the Father seeks are those who worship in spirit and in truth. And we're going to look at how that happens. What is that all about? And then the last thing that we're going to look at today is the personal and the public dimensions of our praise and worship of God. Because it's not enough for me to just do it on my own at home. That's why we're all here today. There's a public dimension. There's this shared um, elements of praise and worship. We worship alone, but we also worship together. So the first thing, the full body experience of worship and praise. There's this quote we looked at last week from C.S. Lewis where he says, delight is incomplete till it is expressed. Now, God in his wisdom has made this way of faith more than just an intellectual thing. He's made it more than an abstract idea. Over and over in Scripture, he says, sends his prophets to look at actual things. He sends Jeremiah to the potter's house where he sees this guy working with pottery. There's, there's things that we do that express worship and praise to God. We use our bodies. We have to engage our bodies in worship and praise of God. And I doubt you would see at a soccer stadium or at a rugby match or wherever you go to watch people who are passionate about sports who are just enjoying it abstractly. Oh, I'm so glad that the team won like, as an abstract concept. No. Like, there have been stadiums that have collapsed because people express themselves so violently in praise of their team. We as human beings, we long to engage our body in praise and worship of something. And there are so many different descriptions of the, this in Scripture. We try to bundle them into, okay, this is praise, and this is worship. Okay, so now I'm going to praise if I do this, and now I'm going to worship if I do this. It's not this dichotomy of praise and worship. It's like this continuum of very expressive uh, things that we do to much more reflective, personal, deep things, silence and awe. And we're going to look at that. But it starts, interestingly, in 1 Chronicles 15, we start to get a picture of just how extravagant the worship of God can be. And um, if, you can, if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles 15. 1 Chronicles 15. And it's the story of the ark of God being returned to the people of God. There have been 
uh, taken away by the Philistines, and they'd had it for a long time, and uh, it has been returned to the people of God. Now, David, he had been playing his harp in worship to God for most of his young life. And we read in Scripture in, in the book of Samuel how God afflicted Saul with an evil spirit, and David came and ministered to him playing the harp. And so we get this picture that David was already meeting with God in the secret place. And he understood the value of the presence of God. So when the ark is being returned, this is what happens in 1 Chronicles 15 verse 16. David commanded the, chief, the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers <laughs> and who should play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals to raise sounds of joy. So then it talks about how they appointed uh, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan, also called Jeduthun, and these guys became uh, essentially the lead worshippers. And uh, moving down, they go through a whole lot of names of, um, of different people, and uh, there's a guy named Kenaniah, I think it is. Uh, he should direct the music, for he understood it. Not everyone did. And it carries on about, uh, in verse 24, uh, the priests should blow the trumpets before the ark of God. And then verse 25, so David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And because God helped, they were sacrificing as they went. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And also the Levites who were carrying the ark. And the singers and Kenaniah, the leader of the music of the singers, David wore a linen ephod and carries on and talks about how there was shouting, the, the sound of the horn, the trumpets, the cymbals. They made loud music on harps and lyres. None of this was prescribed, by the way. This was David's desire to see his God worshipped and praised. It came out of his heart. And as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michal, or Michael, the, son of, the daughter of Saul, looked out from the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. Uh, in some translations, it talks about how he was uh, undignified. He was clamorously foolish, and uh, his wife didn't think that was very good for his reputation. Um, but David didn't actually care. Now, that's the start, because in the next chapter, 1 Chronicles 16, we're not going to read it, it talks about how David appointed singers and musicians to offer worship and praise continually morning and evening, 24-7. To give you an, extent, uh, an idea of the extent, 1 Chronicles 23 talks about how there were 4,000 musicians. <laughs> and it says they were playing instruments which David made for giving praise. Now, David, at some point, someone must have said to him, I think that's enough. <laughs> 4,000. Like, have you thought of the logistics of this, O king? And it talks about how there were hundreds of singers. Hundreds of singers. And a day and night. So there's this music, there's this creativity that's just bubbling out of the people of God. The presence of God has come back to the people of Israel. And what they can do is they just express themselves in praise and worship. I'd love to know what that sounded like. I'd love to see the instruments on display. Now, music as we understand it today has gone through the era of Greek philosophy. It's gone through the age of mathematicians, and it's been turned into a very systematized thing, which isn't a bad thing. But music is now a language. But back then, it was a spiritual experience. It wasn't an analytical one. It was understood to be the language of heaven, music. And David wanted as many possible sounds to be coming from the people of God as possible. So it's unrestricted expression. And here we want sometimes, I'm, I know myself, I want it to be neckies. And when it's neckies, you know, then it's nice, you know. And I can't, I can't have so, too many instruments because then it just gets like a bit out of hand. If I, <laughs> if I had to manage 4,000 musicians, that would be an unpleasant experience. <laughs> For a sound guy, most especially. <laughs> but as far as David was concerned, it was only fitting. That's what God 
It was what God deserved. The praise of the nation of Israel. Extravagant praise. He understood the power of music. And he wasn't uh, satisfied with only a few or a handful of instruments and musicians. Sadly, there were also tambourines included in the Bible. Um, Exodus 15, I do apologize if the tambourine is your lead instrument. <laughs> if it is your gift. It's, um, amazing. It talks in, uh, in Exodus 15 how um, Miriam picked up a tambourine and she led all the women who also had tambourines. I'm not sure where they all got these tambourines from. And maybe the, Israel, the, the Egyptians were like, when you go, take the tambourines. So all the tambourines of Egypt were... <laughs> Don't quote me, that's probably not in the Bible. But it speaks about how she prophesied with her instruments. And in, uh, I didn't read the verse, in um, 1 Chronicles 25, it speaks about how there were people who prophesied on the instruments. It was beyond words. They would use their instruments to draw people into praise and worship of God. So there's music and extravagant creativity at the heart of our expression. And there are so many ways, I, I haven't even got... Uh, all of them. So please don't look at this as an exhaustive list, but these are some of the ones that are in the book of Psalms. They're in the New Testament. You'll find them through Scripture. We can speak praise and worship. We can sing it. That might not be your preference. That's okay. We can shout it. We can raise hands. We can wave. We can clap. We can dance. There's even a Hebrew word for spinning around like a top. We can have extravagant uninhibited, carefree, over-the-top worship like we saw David. Even his own wife looked at him and said, you lunatic. Then there's kneeling. There's bowing down. We read about tears. We read about groans that express what words cannot. We read about people who are reverent, reverent in silent awe before God. I, I, <laughs> just... Worshipping and praising without even being able to say anything. Moments where we are still and we know that He is God. And sadly, we're uncomfortable sometimes with that. When there are times when that is the fitting response. It's just Sometimes we read in Scripture about how the musicians played with skillful hands where the music was skillfully arranged. That is not a bad thing. That is biblical. But at the same time, we read of spontaneous and unrehearsed worship and praise. So it's not one or the other. We like, as human beings, to categorize things like what's right, what's wrong, okay, who's the in people, who are the out people? Are they doing it right? Are we doing it right? No, there are so many ways in which we can express our worship and praise to God. So descriptions of praise and worship in Scripture are exactly that. They are descriptions. They are not prescriptive. They're ways in which we see others have responded to the people of God. And I love these words from a song called Ways by a guy, Sean Curran. He sang the song we listened to last week, and he says the following. He says, well, he sings it. If I had a thousand tongues, if I sang a thousand songs, there'd still be more to say, more to sing about you. If I had a thousand years, I'd spend them all right here. There'd still be more to say and more to sing about you. I'm never running out of ways, never running out of ways to praise you. Our delight in God is incomplete until it is expressed. And there are so many ways available to us to express our praise and worship to God. And as I was preparing this, I was challenged in myself. I... I'm not, uh, not always, I mean, sometimes I'm a more demonstrative person, but not always. And I used to write, I used to write songs a lot, and I just, with the busyness of life, stopped. So I've been challenged myself to, re to return to a form of extravagance within my own personal worship. So this is something for all of us. There are so many options available to us to praise and worship God. Okay, that's the first stop on our tour. Second top, stop, worship and praise in spirit and in truth. What is that all about? We're asking the question, how? And Jesus says himself that the Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. I'll read the verse. It's John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. He says, The time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Now he's talking to the woman at the well, and she's wanting to know from him, is this mountain the right mountain to be worshiping and praising God? You claim it's that mountain, but it's this mountain. And Jesus said, it's not any mountain. It's in, a, it's in a place you don't understand. It's in a place called spirit and in truth. So we're going to look at what that means. In the spirit, the first part, in the spirit, what does that mean? Well, it talks about how our worship and our praise of God takes us beyond this physical realm. There's more to worship and praise than just singing songs, than just expressing our body. There are, there's more to it. We're actually caught up into what the scripture calls an eternal song. We're caught up into a song that has been going since before the beginning of time as people pour out, well not people, but as the host of heaven pour out praise and worship to God. We're entering into the reality of another realm. That is why praise and worship is so powerful. It can set people free. They can sing a song and see victory in their life. It's not because they've got a nice voice. It's because they've released something of heaven. There's a spiritual component when you and I praise and worship. And it might not be that you're praising and worshiping about something that's going on in your situation. You can praise and worship over the lives of others. It's amazing. Like you can stand here on a Sunday. You can be thinking of someone else and you can be saying, great are you, Lord, over their situation and see something break. Because it takes us in to the realm of power that God has made available to us in Christ. It's not because we sing nice songs. It's not because they're in English or in whatever language. Sometimes it's not in any language. It's the, you, you sing in tongues because you, uh, you haven't got the words. You, it's a groan that the Holy Spirit helps you sing. And it breaks stuff over the lives of people. What does this song sound like? Well, Revelation eight, uh, 4, verse 8 to 11 there's only a few verses on the screen, but it goes, Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is the song. It's carrying on even now. It's going, it's going, it's going. And we on a Sunday all around the world, and some people on a Saturday, some people on a Friday, whatever day of the week it is, we join in the song. In the Spirit, we move into another place. At the start of Revelation, the Holy Spirit, God says, Come up here. John doesn't see it while he's just hanging around in the earthly realm with his natural senses. Come up here. There's a spiritual element. Philippians 3 verse 3, Paul says, we worship by the Spirit. We worship by the Spirit. That's, it's not something that we can manufacture. He carries on that verse. He says, we put no confidence in ourselves. So it's not about your musical ability. It's not about the sound of your voice. It's not about how good you are at dancing. Although, when God has gifted you in those areas, yo, please use them for His glory. Come on. But we worship by the Spirit. It's not a performance. Then in truth, what is in truth all about? Well, when we approach God, it's in the truth of who He is, and it's in the truth of who we are in Christ. That's very important, because... There are people who worship a God of their own imagination. It's not God as He is in His divinity. It's, I mean, if we worship on our own and we never enter into worship with the community of God, it can be easy to form a God in your mind that is a certain way. But in the truth of who God is, He's not some God of, of my imagination. He's the God of the Bible. And he might act in ways that I don't understand. Talks in the Psalms about how clouds and thick darkness surround him. I don't understand, I don't understand that. It talks about God, a God of mystery. You look at the way he interacts with Job. I'm like, Whoa, I don't understand it. I see stories in the New Testament. I think, oh, yo, this God is dangerous. 
So I don't worship some God that's nice and cuddly. He is a fire. Consuming fire. I don't worship a God of my imagination. And I also don't approach him in some flawed concept of self. That's very important. Like when we first come to God, we are absolutely desperate for his mercy and we understand our failings, our sinful nature. But the only reason we can actually draw near to him in freedom and confidence is because he sees us as righteous in Jesus. So the praise and the worship that I offer him comes from that place where my life is hidden with Christ. I don't come to God every single time and say, Lord, I'm not worthy to even praise you. Because that's not true. In Christ, I stand before him with freedom and confidence. And I can praise Him. I can offer Him a sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing. There's an amazing psalm. The line says, The earth is drenched in God's affectionate satisfaction because of what Jesus has done. And that is the place that we come to Him. A place where our life is hidden with Christ. And ask God to reveal this truth to you because otherwise you will feel like you never measure up. And that's a lie. The opposite of truth. (laughs) May you be set free to worship God with freedom and confidence because He has done it for you. An example of two people, uh, this is a really cool story. Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verse 25 to 40, they are sitting in jail. It's not an ideal situation. In the truth of their situation, they are in prison. But they know the God who they worship. And it says around midnight, they're singing hymns to God. And then we know the story. All of a sudden, there's an earthquake and their chains are broken off. You might know that story. They didn't look at what was going on around them and sink into some form of depression. Like they rose up in an understanding of who their God is. And they worshipped and they praised Him and they saw Him rescue them, set them free. And even the, the jailer came to faith. Obviously, I mean, like, <laughs> it's not an easy situation to explain. So it's a powerful story. Okay, the last thing. It's personal and public. It's alone and it's together. How? How do we worship and praise God? Well, we worship and we praise God as an individual, personally, me, David Phipson, a.k.a. Fippo. And I need to find my own secret place with God. That's where I meet with Him. And in Psalm 31 verse 20, it talks about how there's this secret place in the presence of God. And this is where I'm able to lift my love in worship and praise before Him. And it's, <laughs> it's unrehearsed, it's raw, it doesn't sound great. I mean, if you listen to some of the voice recordings on my phone of um, <laughs> like those spontaneous moments, they, they're very much between me and God. I even make sure Shells is asleep. No, but there's this, there's this, um, there's this secret place where my worship and praise with God starts. And so personally for me, I journal a lot. Um, I don't always uh, worship and praise God with my guitar. Um, I create new playlists on my phone, um, and regularly I've got new playlists, and I will play them in the car, and I select songs for specific time. When I'm, I am going through something, I'll select a specific set of songs, and then I just worship and praise God through those songs. If there's something that my heart needs to learn, I make sure I select songs that are going to teach me this And then I worship and I praise through those songs, both at home and on the road. You don't have to do that. I'm just giving you a a sense of what what I do. And my current playlist is called Infinite and Intimate. And they are songs that are, one, expressing the massiveness of God. And then at the other end, it's got these intimate songs of devotion to God. 
You can, you, there's so much music out there for you to go and discover and uh, benefit from other people's gifts. I read books that draw me into the mystery of God. Like um, one that came to mind is, is, is a book by Brennan Manning called The Furious Longing of God. And, I mean, you read, it, it read things that draw you into his presence, that, um, that fuel the ache in your heart for him. And you, you will have read books that are like that. You're like, yo, you read, like the personal story of someone like A.W. Tozer. You, you read these things, or, or Oswald Chambers, who had, um, had these deep understandings of who God was, and you're just drawn into that. Like, Lord, I want that for myself. It's like benefiting from their testimony. And no one can do this for you. You have to dig your own well with God. You can't phone Mark up and say, Mark, I'm just wondering, can you or Nepo come and dig a well in the secret place with God for me? Unfortunately, there's no shortcut to intimacy. There isn't. And it's it's sometimes you, we like to see results. We like to do this. We like this input, this output. God doesn't work like that. We put ourselves before Him, and then we wait. We wait. We wait. He draws near, and then you will be a changed person for sure. I'm going to give you one story. Um, if we could put that picture on the screen of, um, of the alabaster jar lady. Um, this is a painting done by a fine artist, Daniel Gerhartz. Um, as far as I know, he is an American guy. And he was so moved by the story of the uh, lady who breaks the alabaster jar of perfume that was worth a year's wages at the feet of Jesus. She's mocked and ridiculed by the people who are there. And it's challenging. It's raw. I don't know what I would have done if I was there. Like she's, she almost looks like she's having a breakdown at the feet of Jesus. Some of the disciples are like, oh, we could have sold that. You know, we could have like, oh, doesn't Jesus care about the value of this stuff? Like we could have fed the poor. It's like a year's wages. That that's, doesn't make sense. It's crazy. But Jesus ends that passage by saying, wherever the gospel is preached, this story is going to be told. It's in all four of the gospels, this particular story. And the artist says this. This is what inspired him to paint this particular painting. He says, When we are able to grasp a piece of understanding of all that Jesus Christ has done for us by removing our sins and taking in our wretchedness, carrying our burden of debt and paying the full penalty, and in exchange crediting His righteousness to us, what other response is there but to fall to His feet in worship and pour out our best as an offering? And that's what she does. This is a personal thing. It might be in public. And sometimes those personal moments with God are in public. And you look at it and you're like, oh, there's something so holy. That person is on holy ground with God. I don't want to interfere. If I see someone who is with God, let him do his thing and minister to them. So what does it look like? to give our best to God. And there's that phrase that I love. It says to empty the pockets of our lives. What does it look like? There's this uh, story in 2 Samuel 24. Sorry, I know I'm going uh, quickly. But David is given a whole lot of stuff. He's given a threshing floor. He's given a whole lot of animals to sacrifice to God. And David says, no, <laughs> I'm not going to offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. I want to pay full price. So David pays full price. He buys the threshing floor. He buys all these animals that were being given to him. He says, I don't want to offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. And we see how that translates through David's life. With 4,000 musicians, I don't want to offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. It's, it's just so beautiful. But you have to walk that road with God where he brings you to the place of, of an understanding of his value that you're like, ah, I've got to give you everything. And still I hold back. Like there are things in my life that, that I need to give over to God, but I, uh, I just can't. You know, all of us have this. But it's, there's, this, there's this urge in me that, uh, Lord, I, I, what the best of me I want to give to you. Not the last, not at the end of the day when I'm naked. I want to give it to you at the start. That's for me. I'm not saying that you can't have a devotion in the evening. 
I just know that I'm useless in the evening. The best. But now here's the thing. I can't worship and praise God alone. That's not the end of it. We were all very selfish people <laughs> if like, we only wanted to worship and praise God alone. I, don't, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. You know, you've heard that said before. But now the reality is we can't fully understand and know God without one another. To grow in an experiential knowledge of God through praise and worship, I need all of you. Why is that? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so there's this, uh, there's this story in uh, 2 Chronicles 1, verse, uh, sorry, 2 Chronicles 20. Sorry, we're going a little bit Old Testament vibes here. Yeah? Um, 2 Chronicles 20, a guy named Jehoshaphat, king, love the name, great name for a son. Jehoshaphat, and he is under attack, and the, so are the people of God, and the, the tribe of Judah are under attack. And so Jehoshaphat, they fast and they pray, and then uh, this is what God says to him. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. This is in verse 15. Do not be dismayed at this great horde, <laughs> for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go out against them, and behold, they will come this way and that, and tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. So that's the instruction. There's nothing else. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping, fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then it says the Levites, the Kohathites, and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord with a loud voice. So we've got a whole lot of people bowing down. We've got a whole lot of people who their response is to stand up and praise God in a loud voice. And then they rose early the next morning. And now this is not something that God told them to do. This is something that the people agreed. This is what they're going to do. It says, they agreed that we we're going to appoint those who were to sing to the Lord and praise Him. They would be in holy attire, and they would go out ahead of the army. Not something that God told them to do. It's something that as a people, together, they decided to do. And they were going to sing, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. And when they began to sing, the Lord set an ambush against their enemies. And we know how the story ends. And it talks about how that took, took them three days to collect the plunder. But we need each other. I might have one response in worship, but others around me have a different response. And C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He's talking about a friend named Charles Williams who died. There were three friends. There was C.S. Lewis, Charles, um, and a guy named Ronald, who was J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, like power friendship. And Charles died. So he says this, In each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can bring out. By myself, I'm not large enough to call the whole person into activity. I want other lights, other than my own, to show all his facets. Now that Charles is dead, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to a specifically Charlesian joke. Far from having more of Ronald, having him to myself now that Charles is gone, I have less of Ronald. He says this, we possess each friend, not less, but more, as the number of those with whom we share him increases. Which means that as the people of God, we experience more of him as the number of people with whom we share him increases. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven when we are sharing him with billions and billions of people? There's this cloud of witnesses already. And then as we share together with each other in praise and worship, we see different facets of who God is. We need each other. Another way of putting it, just before we close, I love, love, love this quote. Donald Miller, he's talking about how he's watching a jazz musician play, and he never really liked jazz until he watched a jazz musician love jazz. He says this, Sometimes you have to watch somebody love something before you can love it yourself. It's as if they are showing you the way. I love that. And when we are together in worship and praise of God, 
it's as if we are showing one another the way to love Him. And the way that you love Him and the way that I love Him, they're going to be different. And that's fine. We're never going to run out of ways to express our praise and our worship to God. But if all we do is on our own at home, we miss out on so much that God would reveal of Himself. We need each other to increase our expression so that we can increase our delight in God together. So, to sum up, how do we worship and praise God? Three things. We embrace the fact that it's a full body experience. It's extravagantly creative. It's expressive. Sometimes it's being silent. Other times it's being allowed. But we'll never run out of ways. May we never run out of ways to express our delight. That's the first thing. The second thing, we worship and praise God in spirit and in truth. In the spirit, we enter into the reality of another realm beyond the physical world. We join in this eternal song that's been going on before the beginning of time. In truth, we approach him in the truth of who he is and in the truth of who we are in Christ. And then the last thing, it's personal and public. It's alone and it's together. And it's in the secret place where we come back to an audience of one. It's him in the secret place. On the stage, it's very, it's very different. It's a very different experience. It's easy to get caught up in the moment. High energy makes me think, oh, I'm offering high praise to God. But it's when I come back to the audience of one, empty out the pockets of my life before him. But it's also shared. It's the shared space here together with the people of God. And it says in Hebrews 10 about how we must not give up meeting together all the more as we see the day approaching because we can remind each other of the God that we are worshiping. So ultimately, it's a question of a heart offered up to Him. It's a life laid down in devotion before Him. That's the way to intimacy with this infinite and intimate God. So last verse before we close. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. If you don't know where to start, Just put it all before him. William Temple once said this, Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of the mind with his truth, the purifying of the imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of the will to his purpose. Let's pray. Our Father, we just um, we come before you today longing to offer you praise and worship, Lord, to bring you our best, to learn what it is to worship and praise you in spirit and in truth, to be the worshipers that you seek, Father. And I thank you that you already, as your word says, you rejoice over your people with singing that you rejoice over us because of what Jesus has done. We can only come and lay our crowns before you because Jesus laid his crown down first to pick up a crown of thorns. We can only draw near to you because Jesus was forsaken, because he was cut off. We can only lift up our hands to you, Lord, because Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And in all these things, Lord, uh, the only fitting, logical, intelligent response that we can offer is to worship and praise. I pray, Father, by the Holy Spirit, would you begin to awaken desire in our hearts to worship and praise you, Lord. Not just on a Sunday. Father, may we find a secret place with you. Lead us. Your word says that no one can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. Would you draw us, Lord? Draw us into the presence of God. Draw us into the presence of the Father. That we can express our delight, Lord. We can delight in you and express it. And I pray for myself. I pray for all of us, Father. Would we become less concerned about what people think of our expression? Lord, would you help us to be true? Would you help us to be free in our worship and praise of you, Lord God? And I thank you for the incredible witness of praise and worship, Father, 
It's almost as if evangelism is a form of praise where we are showing others the way to worship and praise this God. May our lives, Father, as we give ourselves to worship and praise you, Father, may our lives show other people the way. The way that is Jesus, the only way to approach you with freedom and confidence. Thank you for this incredible reality. In your powerful name, amen. Amen.